not great. Again, it's tough to fabricate these angled and uh, it still has no planes of symmetry and there's still going to be some awful parasitics and so also not great. Okay, so let's do the third um, uh, constraint, uh, sub-constraint space and, you know, um, not only should, by the way, rules of thumb, not only do you move constraints as far away from each other as possible, but try and make them as orthogonal as possible because uh, orthogonality is magic in three-dimensional land. I mean, even Cartesian coordinates are orthogonal, right? So make these angles 90 degrees and spread them as possible, far as possible, and then spread these out as far as possible. And this one's much better. Um, I mean, it's still very difficult, you know, to, to, um, to fabricate this, but at least these are symmetric. There's a symmetric axis right here about its rotation there. So as you rotate that, that that's not going to have too bad of paras parasitic error. But if you rotate here, there's going to be some problems. So I like this one the best of all three we've done, but it's still not great. Okay. Well, okay, let's look at the fourth. Hope the fourth is good. Okay, so here we could pick three things from the plane that don't intersect at the same point and one thing from the sphere. But the other thing we might notice is, remember, we don't, you know, so far you guys only know what wires and blades are. But we've only been designing stuff with fact with wires and, and lining up the wires with, with, uh, with things. We could, this is the first sub-constraint space where we could also use a blade. Because anytime you have a solid filled in blue plane that holds three non-redundant things, instead of using three wires, you could just use a solid blade. And uh, that, that you know, simplifies things a lot. And, and then just use one uh, wire. So, we could use three wires, um, you know, but uh, here is one, one possibility is just use the blade instead. It kind of thicken it uh, and make it long. Um, and, and the nice thing about this sub-constraint space is you, you can only get, you could use one and make it perpendicular. That's much easier to fabricate. It's still not great, but it's much easier than these angled things. And so you could either put three wires on the side or do this to exactly constrain it, okay? Downside of this is it kind of cuts in the mirror, but maybe it's fine. You know, this, this won't, maybe you can reflect off everything you don't care about that part and it could steer it, I don't know. It does simplify things, okay? And it is symmetric about this axis here, not so much about this one, okay? So it's like, ugh. Again, we're not in love with any of these, and that, that's a problem. So things you can start doing to get creative is say, well, maybe it's worth over-constraining you know, to get symmetry, to fix parasitic errors, to make things cleaner, and and maybe since we're probably cutting these with DRIE or in, in the clean room, some kind of etching process, we're going to make them out of the same wafer, and and so maybe the problems with over constraint aren't the biggest deal, um, and, and we can get enough precision. Um, so what you can do is take all four of those past designs, plop them right back in the constraint space, and and just add as many constraints as you need, but use as few as possible. Um, one way we could do it with this one is to add another flexure blade on the other side. Unfortunately, that over constrains it three times, right? Because this is it's already exactly constrained. Now you add this, and it's this whole thing, all three things in there are over constraining it. So that's not great. But now, at least with this design, we have a simple wire that's easier than all the angled ones to fabricate, and it's um, symmetric about that axis and this axis. So both rotations won't have parasitic errors, and it's a little cleaner and probably easier to control. Um, you know, it might have been better to just uh, use your three wires and add a fourth to over constrain just by one in there. Um, you know, that, that might be better than this. But, but anyway, regardless, we don't really like any of these things. Um, and so, you know, you either pick the best and, and just go with it, or you can start questioning, did they, did they, um, you know, could they tolerate another degree of freedom? You know, sure, they wanted those two degrees of freedom. By the way, this is just to design parallel things. If you want to design serial or hybrid things, there's many, many other options. So this is just all the options for parallel design things. Single stage connected directly to ground, right? And these, by the way, are only the options with blades and wires, okay? There's infinite other geometry flexible elements you could use. So. It's, it's not as limited as you think, um, but you can consider all the options, okay, is the cool thing, no matter how complex it gets, okay? So, okay, so, so but going back, um, 
you know, you, you could ask the person who told you to design this, are you sure you just want those two? Are there other degrees of freedom you could tolerate not being constrained that you don't care about? Or maybe there's a degrees of freedom you don't realize you want. Um, and you could ask yourself, well, do you want a rotation there? Well, that one has to be constrained. Because if, if all these like checkerboard things rotate, they'll, they'll collide into each other and, and hit each other. You don't want that, okay? So um, what about this translation, okay? Um, you know, can they move like this? Well, they'll, they'll collide, so no, you need that constraint. Uh, what about this one? No, you need that constraint. Okay, well, what about this one? And you look at that and you're like, oh. You know, if it can translate out of plane, that's kind of a piston motion with all these mirrors. Um, you know, it w certainly won't collide or bang any of the mirrors, and you could, you could modulate the phase of the light that bounces off of it. And by modulating phase, you can also steer light, by the way, through constructive and destructive interference. So, so you might tell them, well, okay, you know, I, I, I was thinking I just want to steer light from tip and tilt, but maybe I can steer light and modulate phase by doing piston as well. You can also, by the way, if you could only rotate both, then when you get these um, mirrors together, you know, they, they rotate like this, and, uh, and, and it's like a segmented, you know, uh, mirror. Right? But sometimes if you can do piston, not only can you rotate, but you can raise it up. So now it feels like a smooth uh, mirror surface. So you actually, if, you, if you're smart and you know what you want, um, you, you really want piston. You want tip tilt and piston for a micro mirror array because, um, and you want all the other directions constrained. You know, so you can, you can uh, not only steer light, but make reconfigurable kind of mirror surfaces that don't have big cracks the light can fall in and, and they're not as segmented. They can, they can lift up and smooth out the mirror and, and modulate the phase and do all kinds of neat things, right? Okay, so, so, so and by modulate the phase, I mean like, you know, if, if it moves up or down, you can uh, speed up how quickly the, the light reflects or slow it down and that can change the phase at different pixels or, or at different mirrors. Um, so, so they, they, constructively or destructively interfere and do some interesting things, okay? So, okay, so, so it's like, okay, so that's what we want. And, and maybe you push back and you realize that. So let, let's, let's design a micro mirror array with these degrees of freedom. Okay, so we kind of start over. We say, okay, let's look at the fact library. We want three degrees of freedom this time. We look in there, there's nine options here. Which one is it? You know, you look through them and you find this one is the one that contains the motions you want, okay? You can see the, you know, this is, this is a red highlighted plane that's filled with all red lines, so it contains this red line, that red line, the intersecting ones, and it's got that perpendicular translation. So sometimes it can be tricky to find which freedom space contains the degrees of freedom you want. I'm going to teach you a ton of approaches to make sure you find the right one every time, and some of them are faster or slower than others, right? But, um, but if you're not familiar with the fact, right, and you can't just look at it and know which one it is, um, don't worry, I'm going to give you a bunch of tricks, okay? So... Okay, so, so you know that's the freedom space, um, and this guy links to the constraint space, which looks the same. It's basically a plane, a highlighted blue plane, and, and that's a much simpler thing, okay? So, so if, um, you know, they say they want these motions, then you say, well, you have to get every rotation on this plane. So, uh, you know, not only will this do tip, tilt, and piston, but it'll also rotate around any any line on that plane, which you think is awesome. You know, if you imagine it rotate on any line, you can really get that mirror to move around to steer the light and phase modulate stuff. So that's exactly how you want a micro mirror to move, is with all those permissible motions. Um, this is the best freedom space for a micro mirror for sure. Um, okay, so, so then it's like, okay, then, then here's the constraint space. Okay, it's, it's a coplanar plane. And you know, since there's three degrees of freedom in, in the freedom space, six minus three is three, so you know you need to pick three. And, and so now, you know, that's the design space. It's, it seems very boring and trivial. Uh, it's just a plane. And, uh, you know, you have to pick three. And if you look up in my master's thesis, you would find there's only one sub-constraint space. And you could probably already deduce what that one sub-constraint space is at this point, which is it basically says, you know, the, the first and only sub-constraint space says pick three wires or pick three constraints that don't all intersect at the same point. Because if they did, they'd be a sphere, or sorry, they'd be a disk, or they'd be parallel and would intersect at infinity. Okay, so you could pick those. Now you could pick three wires, or again, you could pick a blade, 
you could just have one blade stuck to a mirror and that would do the trick you know it would be tough to make it you, you might have to make it uh, symmetric right to make make get rid of the parasitic errors the you know drifting axes of rotation over large deformation um, but 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 actually you can probably do a better design with just wires okay and interfere with the light less okay so so here you could you could you know uh, you know um, constrain this would be exactly constrained if, if the mirror is forced to be a square you'd put uh, three things on the side and and you'd make them as you know long as possible you know as, as close to this as possible so if you put it in an array it doesn't interfere as much because you're not going to be able to control light that falls on this or between it um, and the longer you make it then the, the more it can deform over a larger range without yielding um, and so that's that's you know you could probably get a lot more range out of wires than blades because um, blades would take up a lot more space and cut into the light and they can't be as long so here's a nice way to package them so they can be long and deform over a large range without yielding Okay, and, and but this might be a, a, a smart time to go back to your employer and say, look, look do you really need your micromere array to be squares? You know, because there's other ways to fill space. What if your micromeres were, uh, you know, uh, triangles, equilateral triangles? Those can fill space. Um, and then with a triangle, you could, you could, you could exactly constrain it because it would be much more. I mean, this is not very symmetric, right? Um, with a square, I mean, what about this side? It doesn't have anything, right? Um, so it'd be cool if you had an equilateral triangle and then you could put just the three things that'd be exactly constrained and you could fill space and do the, all the same things. Um, another thing you could do is, uh, uh, you know, uh, hexagons fill space. Okay, they're, they're the other, they're the third and, uh, you know, there's really only three shapes that are regular that fill space. That's squares, triangles, and hexagons, right? Um, but hexagons might not be as good as the triangles in this case because you couldn't, you know, the, the, the edges aren't as long you'd have to have three wires on three of the six edges and those aren't don't get to be as long so you don't get as much range you know but um, but you know maybe there's there's ways around that you know um, right but but okay so say the guy comes back to you and says no 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 it has to be squares for whatever reason then, then what you'd probably say is okay well then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it back in the constraint space and just for symmetry and beauty sake and you know we're, we're going to over constrain it because if it's a square we're just going to add one thing and that's probably fine because this is a, a single sheet of silicon we're going to etch out of and a lot you know since we're not assembling the redundant constraint um, it's probably not going to fight the other constraints as much now again if, if there's residual stresses in there uh, they may fight or if you have uh, heat in you know on one side a, a gradient of heat then they'll expand more than others and they'll fight but um, you know, this is a very low order of over constraint and is probably tolerable. And so if you have to go with a square, then there you go. Okay. And so this would be a pretty good design. You could, you could put this in a nice array and, um, you know, th there is some dead space here, but it's fairly minimal and you can steer this thing. And it, it's really nice because all the flexures on the side. So there's a lot of space below it to actuate it. And I'm going to teach you how to actuate flexures too in the last lecture of this course. And you'll find there's a thing called actuation space. And uh, you'll find this one has an awesome actuation space, too, whereas all the other designs had horrible ones. So this is probably, if you had to have square micromeres and um, you had to fabricate them in the clean room, uh, which you would want to do, um, unless 3D printing gets really good and you could 3D print it, um, and then there may be a better design. But, but, but for that, um, but I still think uh, this is the best design, even if you do 3D print it for a parallel system. Um, with the actuators directly behind it for, for, for many reasons. Um, but, but again, it's, it's not the best micromere array um, because there are hybrid designs that are, that are far better, uh, that, that you get a lot more um, uh, speed and range and, and uh, all sorts of benefits. So, um, and maybe a future lecture I can, I can share that. Um, but, but anyway, um, uh, the application, I told you there's applications I would tell you about these. If you have micromere arrays that uh, you can move very quickly, um, you know, you could, um, you could have an autostereoscopic display where, you know, imagine, uh, you know, you had a, 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 this, this entire um, uh, surface, the screen were all these mirrors and I had this projector shining on it. Um, you could, uh, you could, uh, without glasses, um, be looking at this, and it, it projects a particular images, say, from Star Wars or something, 
how it would look with respect to this eye. You know, if you have IR cameras, they can know where your eyes are um, and triangulate the location of both your eyes. And, uh, and then it, it could shine one image with respect to my left eye. It would hit this. All the mirrors could, could steer that into my eye, and, and it would project an image that would construct it so it would look like an image from my left eye. Right? It would steer it all in there. And then very quickly reconfigure, and this could flash a new image with respect to my right eye and could blast it in there. Um, and I could see it from the two different perspectives. And the cool thing is you know, your eyes can only see, you know, at like 30 frames a second, um, you know, 24 to 30 frames a second. And so, you know, as long as these mirrors can, can tip and tilt and reconfigure um, faster than that, then you can, you can, you know, um, shine it in both eyes. Now, w with mirrors that are small enough, I mean, these are centimeter-sized mirrors, but, you know, if you can make these millimeter-sized mirrors, um, which is easy in a clean room, right, then, then these things can move like 40 uh, kilohertz. And so that's, you know, 40,000 times a second. Um, you can handle like, you know, 200 people in a room. Each of their two eyes, you could shine unique images into each eye. And so as they get up and move around, first of all, you'd have vertical and horizontal parallax. It would look real. You'd start seeing, you know, you know right, right now you go to movie theaters and, and uh, you wear the glasses, first of all, and they're, they're annoying. But secondly, they're, they're always blocking out the two, they're always showing you the same two images. So if you ever get up in a theater and walk around while you watch the current uh, 3D movies, um, they look like paper cardboard cutouts because you don't see more information, uh, you know, pertaining to your perspective. Everyone sees the same two things. And it's fine if you're just staying still. Um, but it can give people uh, motion sickness or, you know, all kinds of issues with their eyes. Uh, it can make them feel weird because it's not quite natural. But this approach, you wouldn't need glasses. It would be autostereoscopic. And... Uh, you'd see the movie from different perspectives as if it was a play. You'd see different aspects and you can get around and move around and look 3D. And so um, this could be the key to ultra deception and, and invisibility and all kinds of crazy things. Um, uh, ultra camouflage and stuff, it, it, you know. Yeah, anyway, um, other applications, you could shine a super high pulse laser off this thing and, um, and uh, you know, if you have, again, IR cameras that can track, you know, say I fire a, a bullet at you at close range, um, you know, there are heat-seeking, you know, IR cameras that can tell where the bullet's been fired from, what trajectory it's on very rapidly after it's, it's only traveled a meter or so out of the gun. Um, and then it could, it could re tell these mirrors to reconfigure, you know, and if they can do 40 to 45 kilohertz, this is easy for them, reconfigure, and you put a very high power pulse laser um, that you spread out, uh, you know, spread the fluence out over the entire surface of the array so no mirror gets fried. It spreads out the power over the whole mirror array, but then they can quickly reconfigure and focus all that energy to a single spot that can uh, hit that bullet. And uh, you can actually basically kind of flick the bullet out of the air. One, you can melt parts of it and cause it to start tumbling out of out of control or you can heat the bullet so quickly with these pulses of laser it, it uh, causes something called a photoacoustic energy transfer where it causes a burst of, of power that can redirect the bullet so so and as the bullet gets closer to this system it, it would direct more energy to it It could focus it better and kind of melt uh, the bullet so so basically the idea is you could um, uh, th this system we calculated uh, if you fire you know you know a, you know, a couple machine guns, you know, 60 rounds a second at you at close range, as long as you're further than like 10 meters away when they're firing, um, this system could possibly redirect and knock the bullets away from you. So it's like a force field. It, it, it protects you from all the bullets. Um, and, and it could very quickly turn around and, and shoot the, uh, the shooter, you know, with, with this powerful laser and kill them as well. So, so it could kill them and, and, and uh, redirect the bullet to protect you. So, so that, that, I mean, that's one crazy application. There's, there's many other things you could do if you can manipulate light. Um, you know, this could dramatically improve um, 3D printers. Most 3D printers steer lasers uh, to do a number of things, to, to print stuff. Imagine if, instead of steering a single laser, you steer, you know, thousands of lasers simultaneously or control them all together over large ranges with very high speed and precision. Um, you could dramatically improve the volume and the, the resolution and the speed of uh, 3D printers that use lasers. Um, 
and you know confocal microscopes, uh, lidar. There's just um, anything that scans. Uh, you know, yeah. Anyway, there's just just anything that scans. This could be a very disruptive uh, uh, technology. So micromirrors are are powerful and um, and uh, you know flexures are the way to go to design their their bearings. So in a future lecture when we talk about uh, hybrid systems, I, I can show you. Uh, the best uh, micromere design. Okay, and with that, um, that concludes uh, this lecture.